Uh, okay. I'm very happy. Uh, by the way, my name is Lauren. I, I think I know everyone in this room, but I'm uh, Lauren from UATX. Okay, I'm Lauren from UATX. Um, doing a guest introduction here uh, of uh, my friend and former teacher, Christopher Nadon. Professor Nadon is Associate Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College, uh, where he teaches courses on ancient political thought, the roots and rise of secularism in the West, Lincoln and Douglas, and on various approaches uh, to education for freedom. Um, though Professor Nadon is publicly known today for his courageous advocacy for liberal principles at Claremont McKenna against the increasingly authoritarian surveillance state that prevails there. He is an established scholar of ancient political thought, having specialized on the work of the unfortunate, uh, unfortunately forgotten but brilliant philosopher Zeneca. Most recently, Professor Nadon has published a disheartening account of the threats to liberal education at his home campus in uh, the City Journal that I would commend everybody online and in this room. Uh, he earned his BA and PhD at the University of Chicago under the great political theorist Alan Bloom. And the title of his talk today is Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass on Black Colonization. Professor Nino. Thank you very much. Uh, I should say I want to first thank the Salem Center for having me uh, give this talk. Uh, I was invited to Michigan State University to give a talk. And I proposed talking on uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass on black colonization. And they came back and said, could you do something a little less controversial or potentially controversial? How about religion and politics? <laughs> so I gave a talk on religion and politics. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, I hope what I have to say today proves not to be actually perhaps as controversial as, uh, as, as it might sound a little bit from the title. Um, and I would also like to just say uh, that uh, my own studies of Lincoln were initiated by my friend uh, Stephen Counts, who was a longtime teacher at Michigan State University, who unfortunately passed away uh, a couple of years ago, leaving behind a manuscript on Lincoln, which I hope will be published soon. When it is, uh, everyone will be in, uh, in for a real treat. Uh, he was an outstanding student of Lincoln. I think much of what I know about Lincoln, I think I learned from Steve Counts. Uh, okay, on August 14th, 1862, Abraham Lincoln invited a group of free blacks from the District of Columbia to the White House and delivered to them an address on the subject of black colonization. He sought their support for a projected effort in Central America. Present was the Reverend James Mitchell, Lincoln's commissioner of immigration. Emigration. Uh, Mitchell had served as an agent for the Indiana Colonization Society in the 1850s. That society had been provided $5,000 by the state legislature to colonize blacks then in Indiana out of the country an appropriation made subsequent to the 1851 revision of the state constitution that barred free blacks from settling in Indiana. Also present was someone acting as a stenographer. Lincoln had his remarks published the very next day in the New York Tribune, even before he'd received the delegation's response. Those present in the room were clearly not his only audience, if in fact they were any part of it at all. Lincoln begins by acknowledging to the freemen that, quote, your race are suffering, in my judgment, the greatest wrong inflicted on any people. The suffering he extends, he knows, beyond the condition of slavery to include the plight even of free blacks in the United States. The aspiration of men, he says, is to enjoy equality with the best when free. But on this broad continent, not a single man of your race is made equal, equal of a single man of ours. Go where you are treated best and the ban is still upon you. Just five days before this speech, an anti-black riot had broken out in the Chicago docks, anteceded by others in New York, Cincinnati, Toledo, and New Orleans. Worse, much worse was to come. Lincoln continues, I do not propose to discuss this, the situation but to present it as a fact with which we have to deal. I cannot alter it if I would. It's a fact about which we all think and feel alike. The fact that blacks are not under equality with uh, social or political equality with whites in the United States. But he then makes a claim, turns to a claim about which I suspect he and his audience did not think and feel alike. 
See our present condition, he says, the country engaged in war, our white men cutting one another's throats, none knowing how far it will extend, and then consider what we know to be the truth. But for your race among us, there could not be war. Although many men engaged on either side do not care for you one way or the other. Nevertheless, I repeat, without the institution of slavery and the colored race as its basis, the war could not have an existence. Now, before proceeding, I think it proper to acknowledge that few things Lincoln ever said great so much on our contemporary consciousness as this speech on colonization. This looks or sounds to us like someone using black faces as political props to engage in racist victim blame and gaslighting them to boot. But this reaction brings with it some problems. When dealing with controversial historical subjects, we must be especially on our guard against the dangers of so-called presentism, a vice that cuts us off from genuine engagement with the past by immediately judging and rejecting it as falling short of present day standards, a vice that can inadvertently restrict our understanding to that contained within our own necessarily limited historical horizon. Now, I don't think we should simply look at the past with bland equanimity at all the crazy, self serving, self contradictory policies and statements that it presents to us. We don't do that with the present. And the past was once present. But for the past to be useful, useful to us, we need to sit in judgment on it. I only think that before judging, we need to walk a mile in the other guy's shoes. In this case, Lincoln's shoes. How could Abraham Lincoln both have made this speech and remain worthy of our respect? To anticipate my conclusion, I hope to persuade you that Lincoln thought this speech a rational and even necessary means to attain the noble goal he set for Americans in 1854 of making the Union forever worthy of being say, of, forever worthy of the same by purging it of slavery. Yet to do so without violating the principles of the Declaration of Independence on which it rested, and in particular the principle that legitimate rule rests upon the consent of the governor. But having jumped to the end, let me now go back and qualify a little bit what I said about the dangers of presentism. What I neglected to add was that those dangers do not necessarily apply in the present case for the good reason that I know of no contemporary criticisms of Lincoln's address on colonization that were not also made by his contemporaries immediately upon its publication. Its seeming shortcomings were just as, if not more, apparent the day it came out than at any time since. <clears throat> Here's how the satirist Robert Newell rewrote Lincoln's speech to the delegation of freemen the day after its appearance. Your race suffers greatly, and our race suffers in suffering your race to suffer. The fact that we have always oppressed you renders you still more blamable. 18th, 19th century humor. Uh, less humorous, Frederick Douglass thought the speech demonstrated that, quote, Mr. Lincoln is quite a genuine representative of American prejudice and Negro hatred, and far more concerned for the preservation of slavery and the favor of the border slave states than for any sentiment of magnanimity or principle of justice and humanity. This address of his leaves us less grounds to hope for anti-slavery action in his hands than any of his previous utterances. At the time he wrote this, Douglas was especially frustrated that Lincoln had countermanded the emancipation orders made earlier by Generals Fremont and Hunter. But Douglas along, had been a long-standing and vigorous opponent of black colonization from the beginning of his career as an abolitionist. He despised the American Colonization Society, founded in 1816, to assist free blacks to settle in Africa and later in the Caribbean. According to him, quote, it embodied the, the, the American Colonization Society, it embodied all the malignity of the slaveholder, all the Negro hating spirit of the Northerner. He had a special contempt for blacks who favored colonization as being either dupes or duplicitous agents working against the genuine interests of their people. 
In response to just one such, uh, one such advocate, Douglas wrote in 1853, we make the broad, unqualified assertion that we regard any movement which contemplates the removal or emigration of the free colored people of the United States to any land near or remote as a virtual endorsement of the fundamental principles which underlie the whole fabric of African colonization. The most fundamental principle of the black colonization movement, of course, was that blacks and whites cannot live together peaceably in a free and democratic society. This was not at the time, and perhaps even now, a simply crazy or fringe belief. And I should mention here that there were at the time perfectly respectable and intelligent free blacks who did favor colonization. And that the topic was a subject of debate amongst them and indeed amongst all parties to the slavery question. There were Northern white abolitionists who favored colonization. There were those who opposed it. There were Southern white abolitionists who favored it, and there were those who opposed it. There were anti-slavery slaveholders who favored it, like Lincoln's beau ideal of a statesman, Henry Clay, who eventually became president of the, uh, of the uh, American Colonization Society. And there were slavery, uh, anti-slavery Southerners who opposed it. There were pro-slavery slaveholders who obviously opposed it, but there were some from this group who supported it. There were enslaved blacks who favored it, understandably, but there were enslaved blacks who opposed emancipation if followed and refused it if followed by mandatory colonization. There was one particular black abolitionist, himself a former slave and not lacking in intelligence or judgment, who wrote the following in January 1861 on the eve of the Civil War. Whatever the future may have in store for us, it seems clear that the inducements offered to the colored man to remain here in the United States are few, feeble, and uncertain. We do not wonder, therefore, at the readiness with which colored men are now preparing to leave the United States for Haiti. We can raise no objection to the present movement towards Haiti. We can no longer throw our little influence against a measure which may prove highly advantageous to many families and much service to the Republic of Haiti. Those who want to know more about the subject, it was an editorial, uh, and receives, uh, can receive such information by addressing Mr. James Redpath, Boston, Massachusetts. All such letters should contain a three cent stamp to repay the return postage. Now Redpath was what Frederick Douglass would denounce in 1862 as an itinerant colonization lecture. The author of this pro-immigration article, a free black, who was certainly contemplating the emigration of free colored people from the United States, was none other than Frederick Douglass. I do not cite this passage to bring up Douglass's inconsistency or incoherence on the issue of black colonization, but rather to highlight the importance of timing when evaluating political arguments and statements. Douglass gave his qualified and I think reluctant endorsement of black immigration to Haiti in January of 1861. It was preceded, the article in his newspaper was preceded by another article detailing anti-black riots in Boston and followed by another article expressing doubts about Northern willingness to fight to preserve the Union. In January of 1861, Douglas thought circumstances had changed very much for the worse for free black Americans. It would have been foolish for him not to change his views in light of these new circumstances. When the North did demonstrate its willingness to fight, Douglas accordingly returned to his strong opposition to colonization. The timing of Lincoln's address on colonization is perhaps one of its most interesting and important aspects. Its timing certainly infuriated Douglas. According to Douglas's diatribe against Lincoln, quote, when Congress passed the confiscation bill, made the emancipation of slaves and rebels, uh, uh, slaves of rebels, the law of the land, and authorized the president to arm slaves, which should come within the lines of the federal army, and thus removed all technical objections. Everybody who attached any importance to the president's declarations of scrupulous regard for law looked at once for a proclamation emancipating slaves and calling the blacks to arms. Douglas had certainly not looked for an address that he thought claimed that their presence, that the presence of colored people was, quote, 
in this country, the first real cause of the war. And logically enough, the premises were sound assumes the necessity of their removal. What Douglas could not have known at the time was that when Lincoln gave his address on colonization on August 14, 1862, Lincoln had already, in fact, decided on emancipating or on making an emancipation proclamation. Of course, this also now complicates things. For why, if he had already decided on emancipation, why would Lincoln deliver and publish such provocative and apparently derisive remarks? <coughs> Was Lincoln simply unable to control what Douglas diagnosed as, quote, his pride of race and blood, his contempt of Negroes, and his canting hypocrisy? Lincoln ran for president on the widely accepted principle that the Constitution did not grant the federal government the power to abolish slavery in the states, but that it could do so if it wished in the territories and the District of Columbia. In the first inaugural, he even offered Southern Unionists his support for making this interpretation of the Constitution, quote, express and irrevocable by means of what would have been a very different 13th Amendment than the one eventually passed. He had therefore rescinded Union General John Fremont's declaration in 1861, freeing the slaves of those in rebellion in Missouri. At the time, Frederick Douglass was disappointed with Lincoln. But Lincoln had good political reasons for his decision. He thought, he thought uh, that Fremont's policy uh, would almost certainly have, quote, ruined our fair prospects for Kentucky. And, quote, to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Constitutional scruples, not just immediate political ones, also helped Lincoln back. He explained in a private letter to Senator Orville Browning of Illinois, you speak of Fremont's proclamation as being the only means of saving the government. On the contrary, it is the surrender of the government. Can it be pretended that it is any longer the government of the United States? Any government of constitution and laws, when it, wherein a general, or a president may make permanent rules of property by proclamation? I do not say that Congress might not let propriety pass such a law on the point, just such as General Fremont proclaimed. I do not say I might not, as a member of Congress, vote for it. What I object to is that I, as president, shall expressly or impliedly seize and exercise the permanent legislative functions of the government. Lincoln was also, of course, quite concerned that federal courts, largely still controlled by Democratic appointees and headed by Chief Justice Taney of Dred Scott fame, uh, he was worried that they would ultimately strike down the legality of any such act or proclamation that he made. The gold standard for emancipating slaves, constitutional, was through the action of state legislatures, as was done by six of the original 13 states. Demographics led Lincoln to focus on Delaware as the best prospect to become the first state since New Jersey acted in 1804 to initiate a process of voluntary emancipation within its borders. Only 3% of families in Delaware owned slaves. These slaves totaled the 1,800 out of the total state population of 112,000. Their emancipation would increase the free blacks, number of free blacks in Delaware by a small number from 20,000 to 21,800. The demographics looked good for emancipation. Lincoln approved of allocating federal money to compensate slave owners with the hope that this would make them more willing to do the right thing. He wrote a draft of legislation to do just that and lined up the support of Senator Charles Sumner, a leading abolitionist. In November of 1861, Lincoln explained to Delaware's largest slave owner, if I can get this plan started in Delaware, I have no fear that all the other border states will accept it. In the spring of 1862, emancipation legislation into the Delaware State House was withdrawn by its sponsor, rather than have it go down to a certain, if close, defeat. Lincoln was disappointed, but continued his efforts on this front. On July 12th, 1862, just before the adjournment of Congress, Lincoln called together 28 representatives from the border states and pleaded with them to support gradual and compensated emancipation by state action when they returned to their state to their constituencies. 
He said to them, quote, believing that you of the border states have more power for good than any other equal number of members, I feel it a duty which I cannot justifiably waive to make this appeal to you. Lincoln appealed directly to their financial self-interest and warned them of what was soon to come. If the war continue long, as it must, if the object be not sooner attained, the institution of slavery in your states will be extinguished by mere friction and abrasion. By the mere incidents of war, it will be gone and you will have nothing in lieu of it. How much better for you as seller and the nation as buyer to sell out and buy it, that thing without which the war could never have been, than to sink both the thing to be sold and the price of it in cutting one another's throats. Lincoln appealed direct, directly in this way to their self-interests, prejudice, and fears by uh, now connecting gradual emancipation with colonization. He continued, room in South America for colonization can be obtained cheaply and in abundance when numbers shall be large enough to be company and encouragement for one another. The free people will not be so reluctant to go. Finally, Lincoln appealed to the border state representatives uh, ambition and, and patriotism. He said, our common country is in great pale peril, demanding the loftiest of views, the boldest action to bring it speedy relief. Once relieved, its form of government is saved to the world. Its beloved history and cherished memories are vindicated and its happy future fully assured and rendered inconceivably grand. To you, more than to any others, the privilege is given to assure that happiness and swell the grandeur and to link your own names therewith forever. Let the states which are in rebellion see that you will never join their proposed confederacy and they cannot much longer maintain the contest. But you cannot divest them of their hope to ultimately have you within, with them so long as you show a determination to perpetuate the institution within your own states. You and I know the lever of what, what the lever of their power is. Break that lever before their faces and they can shake you no more forever. Just two days later, 20 of the 28 representatives in reply to Lincoln's appeal affirmed that slavery within a state is a right, quote, no one is authorized to question. And they reminded Lincoln to, quote, confine yourself to your constitutional authority. Lincoln's response to them, taken just one week later, was to turn the lever that they held against them. He informed his cabinet of his decision to issue an Emancipation Proclamation on his own authority. Lincoln thought that the Constitution did vest in him the power to emancipate slaves in rebel ter or territories in his capacity as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States only as a fit and necessary military measure for the suppression of rebellion. The decision and responsibility for the measure had to be his. No general could serve in its place. Accordingly, he informed the cabinet members that their discussion of his proposal would be about would not be about whether to issue the proclamation or not. As he later explained to the painter Francis Carpenter, I said to the cabinet that I had resolved upon this step and had not called them together to ask their advice, but to lay the subject matter before them suggestions as to which would be in order after they had heard it read. There were some surprising reactions. Perhaps the most surprising was that of Sam and Chase, the most radical cabinet member on the issue of black social and political equality. He warned that invoking presidential war powers would not stand up in federal courts. And Lincoln's own arguments against General Fremont's and recently General Hunter's emancipation uh, uh, orders would invalidate his own proclamation. Chase also worried that, quote, a universal emancipation in all rebel territories would provoke uprisings, depredations, and massacres in a race war that would then provoke foreign intervention. Chase concluded, the measure goes beyond anything I have recommended. Secretary of State William Seward was similarly worried about foreign interventions. 
Coming on the heels of several northern military defeats, the proclamation to him would sound like, quote, the last shriek on the retreat, and thereby invite intervention by, English and, uh, by the English and French, who had their own interests in preventing the conflict from becoming a race war. At the end of the meeting on July 22nd, Lincoln was still intent on issuing the proclamation on the following day. But on reflection, and after a visit to the White House that evening by the political fixer Thurlow Tweed, arranged by Seward, Lincoln acceded to Seward's counsels to postpone and to, quote, wait on events. Now, this post postponement also gave Lincoln time to reflect on another cabinet member's reaction, the surprising support for the proclamation of Attorney General Edward Bates. Bates was from the border state of Missouri. He and another border state president, Montgomery Blair, were the most conservative of the cabinet members on the issue of black equality and emancipation. Bates was an anti-slavery Whig and slaveholder, uh, very much in the whole mold of Henry Clay, and like Henry Clay, an advocate of colonization. While a slaveholder, he had served as an attorney for Polly Brown and, and her daughter, slaves who successfully sued for their freedom based on the mother's extended sojourn in the free state of Illinois, a kind of prefiguration of the Dred Scott case, but it turned out it turned out well for the slaves in this case. He eventually emancipated all his slaves, and at least one of them on the condition that he then immigrate to Liberia. And his support for Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was subject to a similar condition. Because he thought the two races could not live together peaceably, he said, quote, he wished a system of deportation to accompany any scheme of emancipation. Along with Blair, Bates thought that the separation of the races was the only way to gain the consent of the border state citizens, perhaps even that of the rebels, to emancipation. Lincoln had just publicly informed the border state representatives that were it not for their failure to adopt gradual emancipation, quote, the war would now be substantially ended. By conceding what I now ask, you can relieve me and much more can relieve the country in this important point. Thus, according to Lincoln, had they acted, there would not now exist in the summer of 1862, the military necessity to issue an Emancipation Proclamation of doubtful or at least debatable constitutionality. Now, I do not think that Lincoln himself thought that colonization was a practicable solution to the problem of blacks and whites living together in a post-slavery future. Here he is at the very close, at the close of his address on the to the Committee on, of, of Colored Men, imitating another Abraham's desperate plea for political salvation, the Abraham who argues with God before uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Says Lincoln, could I get a hundred? tolerably intelligent men with their wives and children to cut their own fodder, so to speak. Can I have 50? If I could find 20 able-bodied men with a mixture of women and children, good things of the fam way of family relations, I think I could make a successful commencement. 20 able-bodied men and their families. Lincoln knew quite well that there were 4 million slaves in the United States at this time. Yet, especially in light of Bates's expression of conditional support for, colon for emancipation uh, uh, and for the proclamation, uh, did not Lincoln have an obligation to continue his support for compensation and colonization if he thought there was any chance that these measures might help the border states to begin to do the right thing and to exercise their undisputed constitutional authority to emancipate? Even if this had then proved to be too little too late, as I suspect Lincoln probably thought was the case, would his efforts have not provided evidence to skeptical federal court judges and skeptical Union Democrats and conservative Republicans that he had in fact exhausted every other possible means before turning to the argument for military necessity. Thus, the preliminary emancipation proclamation issued a month later on September 22nd, contained both pecuniary aid for gradual emancipation and uh, 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 for, for gradual emancipation in the slave states, not in rebellion, 
and the promise of continued efforts to, quote, to colonize persons of African descent with their consent upon the, this continent or elsewhere. By playing to the prejudices of men like Bates, Lincoln could at the same time assuage the constitutional scruples and worries about court challenges expressed by Chase and perhaps even his own constitutional scruples, which, as we will see, were much more demanding than those of Chase. Now, here we might well ask, why should Lincoln pay any heed at all to white prejudice? Why not just emancipate the slaves as an obvious act of justice, as the morally right thing to do? Indeed, the emancip final Emancipation Proclamation, issued 100 days after the preliminary proclamation gave notice as to what would be done on January 1st, 1863, it included Lincoln's claim that he sincerely believed it to be, quote, an act of justice. But justice, in Lincoln's view, was not enough. Because, paradoxically, his principles were those of the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration affirms the equality of all men. Knowing justice, being willing to act on justice, and having the power to act for justice, these are not claims to rule according to the Declaration. Because all men are created equal, legitimate government rests upon the consent of the governed. That means, strictly speaking, legitimate government does not rule. It does not rule us. It represents us. Thus, Lincoln, Lincoln's devotion to the principle of equality and the corollary of consent explains, at least in part, why he was unwilling to follow the advice of his political advisors and postpone the, military, the, the preliminary proclamation until after uh, the November elections, uh, something he could have easily done. The people deserve to know the president's intentions before, not after, the vote. Anything else makes a mockery of representation and consent, and therefore of equality. Yet what are we to do? What is any responsible democratic leader to do when faced, as Lincoln was faced, I think, for most of his career, perhaps all of his career, with the people who did not want to do the right thing? with the people who were, in fact, largely moved by prejudice and even hatred of the Negro. This, I think, is the central problem, the drama of Lincoln's political career from 1854 until his death. And it would have continued as a problem had he been allowed to guide the nation through Reconstruction. Lincoln said at Peoria in 1854 concerning white opposition to black political and social equality, whether this feeling accords with justice and sound judgment is not the sole question, if indeed it is any part of it. A universal feeling, whether well or ill-founded, cannot safely be disregarded. Speaking eight years later on the same subject to the delegation of free blacks in the White House, the situation had not substantially changed. As he said, I do not propose to discuss this, but to present it as a fact with which we have to deal. I cannot alter it if I would. It is a fact about which we all think and feel alike, I and you. Yet even if we assume that Lincoln thought that this universal feeling did not accord with justice and sound judgment, as he told the delegation, uh, and as he told the delegation that blacks in the United States had suffered, quote, the greatest wrong inflicted on any people, Lincoln could not have imposed his understanding of the moral thing to do on the nation without at the same time violating the Declaration's principle of equality, to say nothing of violating the Constitution and the rule of law. He would have violated the democratic morality of the, of the Declaration. The Emancipation Proclamation is a rare, perhaps unique case where its constitutionality stands or falls on what we might call the subjective sense of the person issuing it. Not his subjective sense of right and wrong, of justice or injustice, of justice or injustice, but Lincoln's sincere personal judgment that he really thought it was a genuine military necessity. Uh, that this was Lincoln's view of the matter is, I think, clear from the explanation he gave to Chase in the summer of 1863, when Chase wished him to apply the proclamation to those parts of Virginia and Louisiana that had been exempted because they were already at the time uh, un under union control in, in, uh, in January 1st when the proclamation was signed uh, and issued, therefore 
not subject to, there, there was no military necessity in those areas. If I take this step, Lincoln, Lincoln writes to Chase, must I not do so without the argument of military necessity? And so without any argument, except the one that I think the measure politically expedient and morally right, would I not thus give up all footing upon constitution and law? Paradoxically, the legality, the constitutionality, let us call it the justice of Lincoln's proclamation of proclaiming emancipation depended on him not acting simply on the basis of what he thought just, but rather in response to what he thought was a necessity imposed upon him by external circumstances. Put another way, while the slaves had a just claim to their freedom, Lincoln as the chief executive in a constitutional democracy would have acted unjustly had he, absent military necessity, simply freed them. Yet how could he have been certain in his own mind that the measure was strictly necessary had he not exhausted all other means, including giving public support for compensating slaveholders and for encouraging black colonization if he thought that would speed emancipation, if he thought that those measures might get the border states to emancipate themselves. Paradoxically, Lincoln's public support for colonization demonstrates the depth of his commitment to, not his departure from, the principle of consent, which flows from the kind of equality that is the deepest root or foundation of our Declaration of Independence. Now, you've no doubt noticed that the qualified defense I've just outlined here of Lincoln's statements on colonization portrays them as logically consistent with the principle of consent that derives from the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. But it does not necessarily answer Douglas's accusation, namely that Lincoln himself is, quote, a genuine representative of American prejudice and Negro hatred, that he shows all the, quote, pride of race and contempt for Negroes, typical of an itinerant colonization lecture. Again, from the point of view of the proclamation's constitution, Constitutionality. What matters about Lincoln's state of mind is whether he sincerely thought that emancipation was required by military necessity or not. His personal feelings about the blacks, about blacks, or the morality of slavery simply did not enter into that question. But today, for us, this issue is of paramount importance. It determines our attitude towards Lincoln, whether we praise or blame him or perhaps half-heartedly excuse him as a representative of his time and place. And it determines our attitude and feelings toward the history of our common country. Today, these feelings are, I think, infinitely more important than the academic question as to whether the Emancipation Proclamation was constitutional or not. The Emancipation, the final Emancipation Proclamation, differs most significantly from the prom, uh, preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, I think, in dropping any mention of compensation to slaveholders or colonization of blacks. In their place was the announcement that, quote, such persons of suitable condition from among the freedmen will be received into the armed services of the United States. This decision was by no means universally popular, and it gave strength to the Northern Democratic opposition that eventually rallied behind General George McClellan and almost cost Lincoln the election in 1864. But allowing black enlistment made sense militarily, Lincoln thought. And it also made sense politically, if not in the short, then certainly in the long run. Lincoln understood what Douglas understood and had for a long time advocated. Military service would give ammunition to the freedmen in what they both foresaw would be an inevitable and long struggle to achieve political and social equality after the war. In August 1863, eight months after the proclamation, Lincoln was invited to attend a meeting of, quote, unconditional union men in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. What's not to like about going home? The demands of office kept him in Washington. He knew, moreover, that the reunion with his former constituents would likely not be a happy 
There was a lot of reasons not to go home. These were men who voted in 1853 to ban free blacks from immigrating to Illinois. These were men who responded to the following genuine pride of race rhetoric from Stephen Douglas by supporting him as their senator in 1858. Here's how Stephen Douglas opened the first of the famous debates. I ask you, are you in favor of conferring upon the Negro the rights and privileges of citizenship? Do you desire to strike out of our state constitution that clause which keeps slaves and Negroes out of the state and allow free Negroes to flow in? Never. It's a newspaper account, so they're sort of signs that give us what the crowd, how the crowd reacted. And to cover your prairies with black settlements? Do you desire to turn this beautiful state into a free Negro colony? No, no. And that emancipated slaves become citizens and voters on equality with yourself? He, Lincoln, and the little abolition orators maintain that Negro equality is guaranteed by the laws of God and that it is asserted in the Declaration of Independence. I do not question Mr. Lincoln's conscientious belief that the Negro is made his equal, and hence his brother, laughter. But for my own part, I do not regard the Negro as my equal and positively deny that he is my brother or any kin whatsoever. This is what Lincoln was up against for most of his political career in Illinois. Thus, this 1863 meeting of unconditional union men likely had some conditions. And Lincoln certainly knew them. He addressed the rally via a letter transmitted through his friend, James Conkling. Lincoln instructed Conkling, read it slowly. In Lincoln's day, the speech was considered one of his finest and likely most enduring. Today, it's somehow faded out of our consciousness, undeservedly so. Here's, what, here's Lincoln coming to the main point of what he knew was their disagreement. But to be plain, you, are dissatisfied with me about the Negro. Quite likely, there's a difference of opinion between you and myself upon that subject. I certainly wish that all men could be free. Well, I suppose that you do not. You dislike the Emancipation Proclamation and perhaps would have it retracted. Lincoln then gave the standard defense of the proclamation as an immediate and pressing military necessity. But he added, an important extra constitutional consideration, one that looked beyond the present difficulties of the day. Adopting a hypothetical retrospective view, Lincoln took the audience out of the present moment, beset with partisan interests, passions, and prejudices. He speculated about their situation should the Union triumph. It will have then been proved, said Lincoln, that among free men, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet, and that they who take such appeal are sure to lose their case and pay the cost. And then there will be some black men who can remember that with silent tongue and clenched teeth and steady eye and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind on to this great consummation. Well, I fear there will be some white ones unable to forget that with malignant heart and deceitful speech, they strove to hinder it. Race pride? It sounds to me like race shame. Did Frederick Douglass ever change his view of Lincoln in light of new information and circumstances? There's evidence that he did not. 11 years after Lincoln's death, Douglas delivered a eulogy at the dedication of the Freedmen's Monument to Lincoln, perhaps his most famous speech. Here's what Douglas said on that day. It must be admitted, truth compels me to admit, even here in the presence of the monument we have erected to his memory. Abraham Lincoln was not, in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model. In his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He was preeminently 
the white man's president, entirely devoted to the welfare of the white man. I think it's important when reading this passage to keep in mind also that Frederick Douglass was certainly replying to another lesser known eulogy of Lincoln, given by a black abolitionist in June of 1865 to an audience made up of largely free blacks, citizens of the fair city of New York who had somehow been prevented from participating in that city's formal memorial service and parade for Lincoln. That black abolitionist said this of Lincoln. He was emphatically the black man's president, the first to show any respect for their rights as men. He was the first American president who thus rose above the prejudices of his times and country. That speaker, equal, I think, in intelligence, influence, and eloquence to Frederick Douglass, was, of course, Frederick Douglass. <laughs> How to reconcile these two speeches, where perhaps there's no contradiction to resolve. Perhaps there is no conflict. Could Lincoln have been emphatically the black man's president precisely because he was preeminently the white man's president? Douglas, I believe, thought so, and explains how at the end of the speech that he gave at the Freedmen's Memorial, this is, I think, the finest appreciation of Lincoln ever penned. Lincoln's great mission, says Douglas, was to accomplish two things. First, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin. And second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition, to success, his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiments of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult. He was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. After he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, we, we Blacks, we therefore, thenceforward, were willing to allow the president all the latitude of time, phraseology, and every honorable device that statesmanship might require for the achievement of a great and beneficent measure of liberty and progress. Frederick Douglass understood. What allowed Douglass to understand Lincoln from the inside out, perhaps better than anyone before or since, was the common premise they both shared, or perhaps I should call it an uncommon premise, since at the time, only a small number of Americans held it. This premise, is that there is no essential conflict between blacks and whites. This premise is the opposite and the very denial of the most fundamental premise on which the original black colonization movement rested, to say nothing of black nationalist movements of the 20th century. Lincoln did not think that there was, or Lincoln did think that there was an internal eternal agonism between self-interest and love of justice, a conflict he thought that ran through the heart of every man of every race. But he did not believe in an essential conflict between black and white, nor did Frederick Douglass. Thus, according to Douglass, Lincoln could be preeminently the black man's president because he was emphatically the white man's president. And he could be emphatically the white man's president because he was preeminently the black man's president. There was and is no essential conflict. Thank you. Do you want to get some questions? Yes, questions, denunciations. I'm sorry, you're... What do you think of the Lorenzo's work on Lincoln 
What do I think of what? De Lorenzo. Are you familiar with De Lorenzo? Actually, I assigned, I teach a class on working from time to time. Uh, and uh, I assigned you, I don't assign De Lorenzo's book. I, the students are very much encouraged to do it. And I, I give them a list of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of books, secondary sources that I have to write a report on the secondary sources. And I always include De Lorenzo. They're often drawn to it because one, it's easily available and I think it's quite cheap on Amazon. <laughs> like, so, the usual student motives like push them in that direction. Uh, and, 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 but this list I have of secondary sources, the students don't necessarily know it, uh, unless this gets widely uh, publicized. But uh, all of those books that I assign are very anti Lincoln books. Uh, and it's a wonderful exercise because by that time, the students have actually read. Um, uh, they've actually read uh, a lot of Lincoln before they read the De Lorenzo. And it's a wonderful experience for the students because they see that De Lorenzo, his interpretation of Lincoln is largely an interpretation by what I like to call interpretation by ellipsis. He has to leave out big chunks of Lincoln's text. And uh, it's just astonishing the degree to which I think he twists and uh, knowingly twists because the ellipses are in knows he has to take this stuff out to make his argument. Uh, so, uh, so I think De Lorenzo's argument uh, just doesn't stand the test of, uh, of, of, of comparing what he says Lincoln says uh, with, what, uh, with what Lincoln actually says. And of course, the beauty of this thing exercise for the students is uh, you know, they read a book published by you know, some big press, and they think, oh, it must be authoritative. And then they're like, wait a second, that's not what Lincoln said. How could he possibly say this? And it has the other good effect. Is, uh, they think that anyone with a PhD behind their name actually knows what they're talking about. Can you trust it? <laughs> <laughs> and so by assigning De Lorenzo's book, it, it's great. It, that kind of works to make them both sort of defenders of Lincoln because they now actually have some Lincoln under their belt. And they become distrustful of, uh, of, of, of academics. <laughs> That's not the <laughs> but, but if you want to, but if you'd like to speak in favor of De Lorenzo, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> That's why I'm not a Lincoln scholar, yeah. uh, so I, I really don't have um, as much of an opinion. Just my my impression is a lot of these uh, these thinkers are a lot more complex than we give them credit for. Um, I I read another book on um, the the conflict that Thomas Jefferson went through on the issue of slavery yeah. in his lifetime, and you know you can always take. Um, what they thought at one moment in their life, and maybe it's their entire life, but generally it tends to be more complex. And in the case of Thomas Jefferson, I think it's the case in point. Um, in that book, he was making the argument that Thomas Jefferson wanted to introduce uh, the emancipation in the Declaration, but he had to take it out from the first draft. Uh, but later on in his life, he actually changed his opinion uh, quite a bit because he saw some of the violent revolutions and he did not want to stand behind something that could you obviously the states, so. Yeah, well, I mean, Jefferson's a, a, a very interesting case. And of course, Lincoln himself, on the one hand, publicly says, he has a speech where he says, all honor to Jefferson, the man who, you know, put in a merely revolutionary document, the principles uh, you know, of a free society. Um, but what's interesting about Lincoln, we've listened to the people who knew him, particularly his law partner, earned it, which some people don't. I think Herndon understood Lincoln, but I actually think Herndon's Lincoln is, 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 is probably pretty sound historically. Lincoln personally very much disliked Jefferson as a human being, and not without good reason. Jefferson probably did as much as anybody to perpetuate slavery in the United States, obviously not through the Declaration, but through the purchase of the Louisiana, or the, through the Louisiana Purchase, uh, which, uh, which extended slavery. Uh, over a massive part of the United States at the time. And I think, you know, the debates that we have, the, the, you know, the, the rumors about Sally Cummings and uh, the Jefferson sleeping with the, the slaves, these were all known in Lincoln's day. This isn't some recent discovery. I mean, they were campaign fodder in the, you know, in the, in the election, day, the presidential election. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Lincoln himself uh, did not, uh, did not uh, personally just didn't like uh, didn't like it. You know, Jefferson also founder of the uh, of the Democratic Party, but he for most of his life, and uh, you know he didn't personally like uh, Jefferson or Jefferson's politics, but he did admire obviously the principles of the Declaration, which he thought were the principles uh, of a free society. Uh, but so I think you're right. But these are complicated, and in Lincoln's case, it's complicated. 
Um, but one thing I think that's unfortunate about Di Lorenzo's book is um, there's a lot of libertarian. I mean, Di Lorenzo is sort of famous as a, as a libertarian and attacks Lincoln for not adhering to principles of libertarianism. There is a huge amount in Lincoln that is very pro libertarian. Right? Like, whatever people can do better by themselves, they should be allowed to do. Whatever the government can do better, that's you know, that's a kind of limitation on the government activity. Um, so, uh, so I think in a way he's kind of done a disservice in that sense of uh, that, uh, that, that both like you know when he misquotes Lincoln constantly, and I think sort of presenting Lincoln as being you know anti uh, anti liberty. Uh, Lincoln, this is the liberty guy. Of course, he was an equality guy too, and Lincoln understood that those two things were not always perfectly harmonious. Thank you. I just, just want to think through the tactics of the book that you're writing about. So, when you say that at the end, that, that basically you suggest that Frederick Douglass understood what his tactical approach and appreciate how to be appreciated, when he then objected so vehemently to Lincoln, was that tactical on his own part and the kind of dance that he thought he necessarily had to do? And Cooperation, or was it at the time he didn't appreciate the tactics, and he later came later came to see that the fact that was underlying? Yeah. I think I think it's much more the latter. Um, he did not. I mean, he was furious at the earlier retractions of his emancipation. Yeah, I think genuine fury. I, I didn't. How do you know? Right, it's the printed, printed page. And the, the interesting thing about Douglas, for example, Douglas early in his career was famous for saying that the, he was a Garrisonian uh, abolitionist, uh, and which in the Garrisonians thought that the Constitution was a pact with the devil. And uh, they thought that it was a pro-slavery document. Douglas will break with the Garrisonians for various re very interesting reasons, right? I mean, which is just an astonishing thing. Here you have a, a, a slave who's escaped to the North. He's taken under his wing by these Garrisonians. He's kind of given this abolitionist education, although he'd already given himself a big abolitionist education, uh, as well as his master. He'd given him a big abolitionist education as well uh, before he got to the North. And like they like brought him up and took care of him. And then man, like he, he broke with those people which demonstrates just an incredible degree of sort of character on his part, I think, and the willingness to just stand for what he thinks is right. And one of the things he broke with them over was um, whether or not the Constitution was anti-slavery. So he then, you can read, you know, within like, actually he publishes something that it's, it's pro-slavery, and literally a couple weeks later, something else. And he says, he tells you, I've changed my mind, right? Uh, uh, and, and he then makes the argument. What's interesting about that is, did he really change his mind or did he just think look i'm in america people love the constitution if i want to be effective you know and i'm arguing against the justice of the constitution well that's gonna i'm gonna end up like these garrisonian abolitionists who are not very politically successful right they don't even vote they're telling people not to vote anyway. Douglas like no you vote and he got upset that some of these abolitionists were upset when he bought his own freedom so that he wouldn't be sent back into slave. Uh, and, and they're like, well, how could you give money to slave owners? That's an indirect support of slavery. He's like, when they're coming for you, <laughs> you know, we'll talk about it, right? And so like on that issue is, uh, is Douglas, uh, you know, was, did he genuinely think the Constitution was anti-slavery? I, I think he did, and he gives pretty good arguments for it, but you can never be sure whether that was his genuine sentiment or tactical. But the Lincoln stuff, he really changed his mind once Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He has a wonderful account in his third version of his autobiography, which is a terrific book, and not, well, not, not read enough, where he talks about what it was like. He was in Boston at the time waiting for new was, I mean, People didn't know, was Lincoln really going to sign this or not, or would he back down? And when he signed it, you know, that just kind of changed Douglas's attitude to some extent. Uh, and then he actually came to personally know Lincoln as well. Lincoln invited him to the West White House. Uh, and this was, I think, in the summer of 64, uh, if not before. Sorry, I might have the date wrong. But Lincoln was very disappointed that more slaves had not come in out of the South upon the publication of the, Pro the Emancipation Proclamation. And so he wanted to enlist Frederick Douglass 
to go south and as a trusted black figure authoritatively let the slaves no no this is real like you guys should get out and lincoln at the time thought he was going to lose the election and he wanted to get as many blacks out of slavery as possible before he lost the election to uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, to the democrats in 64 uh, in 64. um and that's a great instance of circumstances right this wasn't the first time that someone had asked douglas to go south uh as a messenger of, of black liberation and calling on the slaves to liberate themselves uh, John Brown had done that, <laughs> and John Brown and Douglas were very close friends, and Douglas had said no. And of course, when John Brown said that to Douglas, it was crazy. Lincoln, and Lincoln said it was crazy. Lincoln, you know, part, part of the reason, at least Lincoln gets elected, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in 60, is he appears much more conservative than many of the other Republican candidates. And one of the things he does, he always denounces John Brown, right? That's not Lincoln's hero. Yet, Two years later, he's asking Douglas to do the exact same thing that John Brown asked Douglas to do. Sort of, right? Not exactly. Uh, so circumstances make for a different, uh, a different, uh, a, 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 a different approach. Um, but uh, Douglas has some very moving accounts of meeting with Lincoln. Uh, he, he says of him, he was the only white American that he was ever in the presence of, and this includes all his abolitionist friends, where he never felt that race entered into their relations at all. Right? So, um, but, so I do think in Douglas's case, this change in opinion um, uh, is, is, was one that came after the Emancipation Proclamation and then after his personal meeting with and dealings with, uh, with Lincoln. Of course, the interesting thing in that memorial speech is why does he I mean, call out Lincoln? I just looked on the internet trying to find a text of it to, to paste and copy. And I said, like, and what I found was the headline. Douglas calls out Lincoln for being a racist, and they quote that passage. Right? And uh, why would he write that then in that very speech? I think part of it was, you know, it was 11 years later. Reconstruction was not going on. Uh, Douglas knew that, you know, that the, 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 the blacks were in a bad situation, and he actually wanted. I think he wanted to create. He called Lincoln. And he's he was at best. He wasn't our father, which is what a lot of the freedmen called him, Father Abraham. He was our stepfather. And I think Douglas wanted blacks to be somewhat distant from Lincoln for their own sake. Like, your father's not going to pay your fat out of the flag. You're going to have to do it yourself. In the original eulogy that he gave of Lincoln in 65, he talks about moving me and, 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 and quite, quite, uh, and, 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 and he praises the, 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 the black woman who says that. She calls him our Moses, right? Douglas sees that. Thinking of Lincoln as the black, as the Moses freeing the blacks, wasn't going to actually work or get it done in America. They were going to have to do it themselves. And I think Lincoln understood that. I mean, the power of the example of black military service is incredible. I taught this course two years ago. I had a student, a black student in there, older guy, uh, graduate student. Um, he brought into class the day we uh, read this, unbeknownst to me, he brought in a picture of the black regiment that his great 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 grandfather had served in. and uh, he had this in his possession it had been given to him his mother had died a few years ago it had been given to him and this guy he's a graduate student he's been a successful banker and, and he told me growing up in chicago his mother and, and they had this picture of the regiment and in the regiment they weren't even sure which one was the great 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 grandfather right because it's taken from the distance you know, wearing uniforms and we got hats on and things uh, but he said that picture was in their front room right their living room and he always said that his mother thought and he you know he was a sex banker who retired early apparently according to him he was the slacker in the family <laughs> and uh, growing up on the south side of chicago and uh, he, he said their mother had always said the key to all their children's success was that picture hanging over the mantle and i think lincoln understood that and Douglas certainly 